I am Gubina and I am a PhD student and I am going to talk to you epidemiology. Right. So uh, some of you may have heard this word. Most of you may not have heard this word. It's okay. We'll get to learn a few things about epidemiology today. Right. So uh, let me start with the question. Um, how do you think that governments decide what is allowed and what is not allowed for us? Like, uh, is smoking allowed in public or not? Or uh, what are the activities that cause pollution? Or that we must wear a seat belt while we drive or sit in a car? How does the government make these decisions? Or, you know, how do organizations recommend guidelines to living healthy, having a healthy lifestyle? Like, how many calories we should eat? How many servings of fruits and vegetables kids should have in a day? Or if we should exercise or do some physical activity? All of these are very important questions, right? And somebody has to make decisions for us to be able to follow them and live a good life. So what are these? These are basically public health decisions. Decisions for the health of the public, right? And epidemiology, something that we are going to look at today, is the science behind these decisions, right? So epidemiology is like the science of public health. Now, this is a huge word, but we can break it down into small words, okay? So epidemiology is made up of three Greek terms, epi, demi, and ology. Ology is basically the study of anything. Okay, so ology we'll keep aside. Demi is people. So demi in Greek means people. And epi means upon. So epidemiology is basically the study of people. As simple as that. It's, it's a term that sounds a little scary, but it's not that scary to understand. So it's the study of people or it's the study of, it's the science of studying the health of people or the health of populations. So what does epidemiology help us understand? It helps us understand how, uh, what we do or what we eat or what we are exposed to in our environments affects our health and the health of the people in the society around us. Okay. Right. So. People who pursue epidemiology are called epidemiologists. Like I am an epidemiologist or I am training to be an epidemiologist. Okay, so what is the job of an epidemiologist? You must have seen movies and you must have seen these detectives and police investigators in films, right? So you can think of epidemiologists like medical detectives or medical policemen. So like detectives, what do detectives do? Detectives ask questions, they collect information from around them, they travel to crime sites, all to find out who committed a certain murder or who did that robbery in that place, right? So who committed a crime? That is the job of a detective. What do medical detectives or epidemiologists do? They also work in a similar fashion. So they also ask questions, they also collect information, they also travel to different places, but their aim is to find out what caused a certain disease, right? So the aim is a little different, but the methodology is the same. So we work like medical detectives. And again, like detectives and police officers, we also work on the five W's. So these five W's are very important for anybody who is in an investigative job, okay? That is the what, who, where, when, and why. So you can imagine why detectives would be asking these questions, right? What happened? Who did that? Where did that crime happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? All sorts of things. Similarly, we also look at these five W's. Here are what is the health event or any disease condition that we are looking at. The who is the person or the population that is affected by that disease. Where is the place or the location where the disease happened? When is the time period? When did it happen? And why? is what caused the disease, the risk factor for that disease. For example, you went to a party and you had some bad food and you got stomachache. So that bad food caused your stomachache, right? So there is a cause for every disease. Everything causes something else. So the why is what caused that disease? Why a certain thing happened? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So let's stop for questions. And while everybody is typing in their questions, uh, that was an amazing analogy with the detective. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think a, a, a good answer by um, Kavish when you asked why, what determines 
the rules that we have to follow or how does the government decide so kavish says maybe if it's causing harm to a lot of people then that's something that's banned absolutely absolutely Great. that's very right that is actually what i'm coming to in the next slide so that's a very smart answer <laughs> another question is what is the difference between a doctor and an epidemiologist okay so um, doctors work towards treating patients so doctors also learn about the biology of human beings epidemiologists learn about people in a different way so epidemiologists are looking at how something is affecting people in a society right if there is a disease that has spread or if there is a certain health condition that people are looking at so the epidemiologists will try to understand why how where when it's happening now once that is found out so once we realize that okay in this society we have the spread of covid 19 so the epidemiologist will do the job of finding the what who why where and when but once a person has covid the person needs to get treated right so for that the person will go to the doctor so the doctor will give him medicines or the doctor will give that person the treatment to get better so epidemiologists actually work hand in hand with doctors and medical professionals i hope that answers the question yes definitely another great question by abhishmat is do current epidemiologists of modern epi- epidemiologists of today work on covid oh yes definitely so a lot of epidemiologists in the last two years even i have gotten introduced to so many epidemiologists who are working in covid 19 so we have epidemiologists working on a lot of uh, diseases infectious non infectious viruses other diseases but in the last two years most of the epidemiologists have actually started focusing their work on covid 19 so a lot of them are working on it especially because it's the disease of concern as something that the entire world is grappling with yes definitely so epidemiology and epidemiologists are very very relevant to our world especially right now but they've always been because we've always had different diseases right absolutely all right so let's move on and we'll come back to questions in a bit great okay so like one of you smart people already said that we can understand why something is uh, good or bad for us depending upon whether it is harmful for us or not harmful for us right so actually that is the basis of epidemiology very rightly so how do we find out if something is harmful or not harmful for us and how do we also find out how harmful or how good it is for that we have science coming to our rescue so using science what we can do is we can gather proof to be able to understand and tell other people whether something is good for us or bad for us like whether smoking is good or bad or whether doing physical activity is good or bad right now how do we find this out to be able to study this what do we do we can study animals in the lab okay we can like you may have seen people use uh, mice people use other animals that they study in the lab in their experiments or what we can do is we can have cells in these test tubes and petri dishes in the lab and we can perform experiments right those are very good and very helpful to give us some of these answers but are they enough they are actually not enough now why uh, is that because we cannot fully understand human beings by studying animals or studying cells because a lot of things have different effects on humans and different effects on other organisms or you uh, animals for example you see three things on the screen right now so we have chocolates we have grapes we have onions i'm sure all of you love chocolates i'm sure a lot of you also love grapes grapes is a very nice food and i'm sure your moms make you eat onions in your vegetables right so all of these things you eat very often and i'm sure that none of this makes you sick they are all good right but these are all very bad for your pet dogs and cats so these things are harmful for dogs and cats i'm trying to say that things will have different effects on humans and animals something might be good for us but not good for animals something might be good for them but not good for us so only studying animals will not be enough also if we study cells in a petri dish in a lab cells that are outside of the human body work differently from cells that are inside the body So if we want to study and understand humans properly we cannot just depend on cells in the lab that is why we need to do something more because we cannot completely depend on animals or cells right so what do we do you could say that we could directly experiment on human beings that's a possibility 
but then in most cases that may not be allowed because it will be unethical or it will be harmful to human beings for example if i say that in a room uh, in a room full of people i will release a poisonous gas and then i will see how the human body reacts to that gas or i will see when people fall sick will that be good that will not be the right thing to do right i cannot put people in danger like that just to be able to see what the effect of the gas on human beings right so in a lot of cases performing experiments on humans may not be practical may not be possible and actually can be quite harmful there is another thing we can do then we cannot experiment on humans all the time but we can observe people we can make observations we could observe hundreds and thousands of people we could see what they are exposed to what they are consuming what they are eating and then try to understand if there is a relationship between whatever they were exposed to and whatever health condition or disease they have okay so observational studies are a very important part of epidemiology and they help us understand how a certain behavior a certain um, eatable a certain substance will affect the population health as a whole okay so uh, any more questions otherwise we can yes yes we can maybe go through a few more questions before great. we jump into this yeah. um a, another great question was do epidemiologists study only diseases in human populations or do they also study animals um epidemiologists actually mostly matlab what i have come across is mostly we focus on human diseases and human populations right because right. animals are usually studied in the lab and we are looking at populations living in communities and with each other so it is focused mostly on human beings yes okay another important question by kavish is if you know if we know that things that are harmful for animals might be good for us or things that are good for animals might be harmful for us why do we still mm -hmm. depend on animal studies because um there are a lot of things that animals can tell about us so humans and animals are different but they are not completely different a lot of our knowledge of human biology has come from animals because we have something similar we share a similar uh, pattern of genes we we share some commonalities with animals like we study mice we share a lot of common uh, you know uh, our biology and the mice biology is very very common in a lot of ways so a lot of our knowledge comes from animals so we cannot completely discard that we animals are very useful to understand a lot of aspects of our biology but then it is not enough like i said we need something more we need to actually study humans also to be able to complete that uh, knowledge circle all right wonderful thank you rubina let's jump into this history lesson now okay so i am going to tell you about some cool things that these medical detectives did in their time so they were epidemiologists and it, they did some very cool science so i'll tell you a little bit about the history but i promise that it's not going to be boring at all i'll tell you a few stories and one interesting thing that each of these people did right so we start with hippocrates now some of you may have heard about him because he's known as the father of modern medicine and if any of you have doctors in your family you would know that there is an oath that doctors take before starting their practice and that oath was written by hippocrates so he was a very famous physician doctor and he was interested in epidemiology back then maybe that term also didn't exist but he was very interested in these five w's that i told you about so he used to observe things around him and look at the what who when why and where of diseases that were there around him especially because in those times a lot of our knowledge of diseases that we have now was not there a lot of things that we know about diseases and the human body now we didn't know back then so he used to make a lot of observations one interesting observation that he made was that malaria and yellow fever these are two diseases that occur in areas that are wet or damp or humid when the weather is humid today we know that these diseases are caused by mosquitoes malaria is caused by mosquitoes and mosquitoes thrive in weather that is humid and they thrive in wet areas back then we didn't have this knowledge so hippocrates gave us this basis because he observed that these diseases only occur in wet areas so he formed the basis of our knowledge of how these diseases spread and that this disease is caused by mosquitoes then we have another person called james lind 
so james lind was a scottish surgeon and he was in the navy so um, people who work in the navy they go on uh, ships and they spend some time in the sea so he used to go with them because there is always a doctor that is needed on board so that is the sailors fall sick they should have a doctor alongside so he used to go with them and on his journeys he noticed that some sailors would fall sick while they were at sea so the disease is known as scurvy but basically what he observed was that sailors had bleeding gums and weakness and pain in their arms and legs and it was happening to a lot of sailors they didn't know why it was happening so he wanted to find out so he started doing some investigation he observed that the diet of these sailors is quite difficult to digest because it does not have fresh fruits and vegetables it does not have fiber okay so what did he do he thought that okay let me try something he took 12 such patients who were not feeling well and he put them into six groups of two people each and gave them an additional thing to eat apart from what they were having usually okay so every group got something else some additional uh, thing to eat one of these groups group 4 got some lemons and oranges that were not part of their original diet so he got they got lemons and oranges and ultimately he observed that this group that got lemons and oranges recovered the fastest and reported back for duty within 6 days and the others were all still sick even after the additional dietary component that they were getting so now we know that scurvy is caused by the deficiency of vitamin c and vitamin c is a very important vitamin that is found in lemons in oranges in a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables and because those sailors were not having a diet of fresh fruits and vegetables they were getting scurvy we didn't know that scurvy was caused by vitamin c back then so only after james lind made some observations and tried this on those 12 sailors we found out that vitamin c deficiency is actually scurvy and it can be corrected by having a diet full of fresh fruits and vegetables so this is also a message for all the kids here please include fresh fruits and vegetables in your diet they may not be very tasty but they are very healthy <laughs> okay the third one is edward jenner some of you may have heard about him because he was very famous so he was an english physician and he was also a lot into observations and looking at things around him and trying to understand why diseases were happening so he observed that dairy maids that is women who work uh, in a dairy setting with cows and cattle if they got cowpox cowpox was a viral infection so he noticed that if dairy maids got cowpox after that they would not get smallpox they will not fall sick from smallpox if they had a cowpox in, uh, infection previously and this was very interesting to him how was one disease protecting against the other so what he did he got hold of a dairy maid called sara hens okay and sara had cowpox so what he did was he took some of the pus from her lesions so if you know all these infections cause pus on your skin so these pustules have a lot of liquid in them so he took some pus from her lesion and he injected that pus into an 8 year old boy called james okay healthy boy that healthy boy fell a little sick for a couple of days but then he was absolutely fine after that then what he did he took that pus from another person who was suffering from smallpox the more dangerous form of the infection he took some pus from another person and then injected it again into this boy and this time the boy did not fall fall sick at all so the boy had got pus from a cowpox lesion and he was fine after a little bit of sickness and then when he got smallpox again it could do nothing to his body this is how he gave us our first vaccine he made some observations tried something and gave us our first vaccine so what he basically did was he protected a person from a stronger form of a virus by injecting a weaker form of a virus into the person so if you have a weaker form of your virus injected into your body your body gets to know that okay this is something we have to fight against and your body starts preparing itself so when a larger infection comes in your body knows what to fight and it can protect you this is the basic concept behind vaccines so edward jenner gave us our first vaccine vaccination the word itself comes from the word vacca which means cow 
So now, you know, you can flaunt this to your friends in class and at home whenever we talk about vaccinations, because we have COVID-19 vaccines also now. So you can tell people around you that vaccination originates from vaca called cow. And then maybe you can recall this story. <laughs> okay, so we have the last uh, medical detective here who is like the coolest uh, epidemiologist from back those times. So this is John Snow. So John Snow, again, he was also very keen on making observations and looking at things around him. He used to stay in London. And in London, uh, he was investigating the spread of cholera. So cholera is a disease where you get diarrhea and loss of fluid and dehydration and you feel very fatigued, very exhausted. So he noticed that a lot of people had started falling sick at a certain point in time in London. And he could not understand why this was happening. Right. He thought that maybe, maybe water, bad water is responsible for cholera. But nobody knew back then what causes cholera. And he wanted to find it out. So what he did was, since a lot of people were falling sick and dying, so he brought out a map of the city. And in that map, he plotted the location of every death. Whenever somebody died, he would plot the location of that person who passed away on the map. And soon he had a full plot, which showed that most of the deaths were around a certain pump, known as the Broad Street Pump, which was providing water to a lot of areas in the city. Once he found that out, he went to the Broad Street Pump and he removed the handle of the pump. So once the handle was removed, the pump stopped working. And when the pump stopped working, the pump stopped providing water. And within a few days, he realized that the cases started going down. People stopped falling sick. So then he could make a connection that it was the bad water coming from this pump, which was making people sick. And that's how he told the world that cholera is caused through contaminated or bad water. So like I said before, a lot of these diseases that we know why they occur today, we didn't know back then. This knowledge was not always there. So epidemiologists made observations around them and tried to find the w, five W's and they gave us some of these very important um, biological facts that we today know. So now we can protect people from cholera because we know that it's caused by bad water. That is due to Johnson. Okay, we can stop for questions. Yes, thank you so much. That was a great, great summary of some <laughs> amazing discoveries. And I think one question that I saw a few times in the chat window, based on these four stories, because a lot of these people who did these epidemiological studies were actually doctors, oh. um, physicians as well. So the question is, is epidemiology done by doctors or is it done by researchers? Actually, it's done by both. So doctors can also choose to be epidemiologists. So I know a lot of doctors who did their medical training and then got into epidemiology. They also took training in epidemiology and started working as epidemiologists. And I also know a lot of people who do not have a medical training, but they are working as epidemiologists. Like I also will be doing that in future because when I complete my PhD, I will be working in epidemiology, but I'm not a doctor, not a medical doctor. So this can be done by both people, whether you are a doctor or whether you're not a doctor, as long as you have interest and training in epidemiology, you can be an epidemiologist. All right. So I think let's move ahead in the interest of time and then we'll come back to questions yes. in a bit. Sure. Right. So uh, like we were saying, these scientists, they made some important observations and did some cool science work. How did they do it? What did they basically do was they correlated an exposure with an outcome. Now, what is an exposure? To put it very simply, an exposure would be any event or any substance that we come in contact with, like not having fresh fruits is an exposure or having contaminated water is an exposure. These are exposures. Outcome would be the disease or the health condition that is caused by the exposure. So like lack of fresh fruits can cause scurvy or contaminated water can cause cholera. So scurvy and cholera become our disease outcomes. Right. So what these scientists did was they correlated exposure to outcome. They correlated that contaminated water causes cholera. But it's not always this easy to establish a connection between an exposure and an outcome. It looks very simple, but it's not simple. Let me show you why. Just because someone is exposed to something and then falls sick does not mean that that exposure caused the disease. For example, if we observe that in a certain city during the first uh, during some months in a year, 
the sale of ice cream goes up and the sale of air conditioners goes up can we say that this increase in sale of ice cream is causing an increase in sale of acs we can't say that right that makes no sense right ice cream and air conditioner are not related similarly there could be another situation where uh, in a city the sale of ice creams goes up and people getting number of people getting sunburns that goes up so if i come and tell you that don't eat a lot of ice cream otherwise you'll get sunburns will you listen to me no no kid will listen to me because that is not how it works you will tell me that no ice cream does not cause sunburns at all right and you are absolutely right just because two things are happening at the same time doesn't mean that one thing is causing the other so ice cream sale is going up and uh, sunburns are going up maybe because it's the summer season a lot of people are eating ice cream but a lot of people are also getting sunburns doesn't mean one causes the other right so these are two concepts which anybody who is getting into epidemiology needs to be clear about just two things happening together is only correlation like sale of ice creams and people getting sunburns but causation is when one thing is causing the other so like bad food causing stomach ache or bad water causing cholera that is causation not every a causes b even if a and b are happening together hmm? some people may ask then why what are the reasons i could feel that a is causing b okay there could be some reasons for that the first reason is that a actually caused b right in some cases like contaminated water definitely causes cholera so a is causing b that's why it looks like a is causing b but there could be other reasons why i feel that a causes b even if it doesn't one is chance just by chance just by chance i am looking at two things that are happening together but doesn't mean that one is causing the other like you play ludo like every all kids play ludo or any other game which involves a dice when you roll a dice any number can come up and that number comes up by chance you don't intend for a number to come up right whatever comes up comes up you say ye to by chance ho gaya i got a 6 by chance so things can happen by chance doesn't seem they have to be cause and effect then there could be other problems like for the example i gave problem with the way you designed your study so if you went to only one city where you saw that ice cream sale went up and air conditioner sale went up or ice cream sale went up and number of people getting sunburns went up you will say ice cream causes sunburns but what if you go to another city and you see that ice cream sale has gone up but nobody is having sunburns what then then your analogy then your outcome will fail then you would say nay ice cream is not causing sunburn so if you have problems with your study design it might appear that a certain thing is causing the other even if it is not true and the last one is sometimes there could be a third interfering factor in this relationship so long ago people thought that coffee drinking causes lung cancer but today if i ask any of you you're all kids but you will also tell me that no coffee drinking doesn't cause cancer have you ever heard of somebody getting cancer from drinking coffee no that's not possible what was happening here was people were not observing that smokers are coffee drinkers people who smoke drink a lot of coffee and it's actually the smoking that is causing lung cancer but we are only observing half of the equation so these are a lot of ways in which you can feel that one thing is causing the other even if it may not be true so this is something that you have to keep in mind two things that are correlated may not always be a cause and effect relationship okay so since we are talking about epidemiology and epidemiology has become very relevant in the times of covid 19 so i thought that i'll put it into context a little bit here not going into details just a very little bit so epidemiology has taught us a lot of things like epidemiology has taught us that infectious diseases are caused by bacteria viruses fungi parasites all of these microorganisms that live in the same environment as we do and epidemiology has taught us that these diseases infectious diseases can pass from one person to the other like if i have a common cold and if i'm sneezing right next to you you will also catch it or if somebody has chicken pox in a home it's usually other people also get it everybody in the home gets it if one person gets chicken pox so diseases spread from one person to the other covid 19 is also a very big example of an infectious disease so it is because of epidemiology that we have been able to understand what these diseases are and how they spread epi has also taught us that what is the virus that causes covid 19 
so in the last two years since somebody was asking epidemiologists are working on covid 19 24/7 and they have found out so many things about this new virus so they have found out that covid is caused by a certain virus and they have also given us some of these interesting terms that some of you may have heard in the news probably may not know what it means but they are very commonly used like outbreak we keep hearing there is a covid 19 outbreak right what is an outbreak an outbreak is just more number of sorry more number of people falling sick than usual so if in a community nobody has covid and suddenly you see a lot of people getting covid that is an outbreak what is a pandemic this is also one word we use all the time now covid 19 pandemic so when outbreaks happen in various places around the world they become a pandemic it becomes a pandemic then transmission route like how is the disease spreading can you get covid by sitting next to each other just sitting no but you can get it by coughing sneezing speaking singing breathing whenever particles come out from your nose or your mouth so this is some information that epidemiology has provided us because every outbreak needs to be investigated and for investigation you have to look at the 5w that i started in the beginning with what when who why and where and for that you will need an epidemiologist that's how epidemiology fits in the context of the covid pandemic as well okay can we have questions yes definitely thank you so much i think this was a really really good explanation of not only epidemiology but how confusing and complex it can also get uh, mm -hmm. when you study it so i think there was one question about chicken pox yes so why okay. does chicken pox spread from one person to another or how does it spread so it spreads through pustules uh, like um, i don't have a picture here but when you get chicken pox you get lesions on your skin so you get these pus filled uh, blisters i could say and they have a lot of liquid inside them and that liquid that white liquid contains that virus that infection so when you live in close proximity you use the same washroom you might touch each other if you hug each other if you sit with each other so that liquid can get transmitted from one person to the other and that's how it can it can spread through towels it can spread through your utensils it can spread through you know holding the phone i am holding it somebody else is holding it that is how it can spread so this is how it becomes infectious and transmits from one person to one okay um another question i think which is more broad in terms of what epidemiologists do so obviously if they see that you know somebody has chicken pox they can try to find out where it's happening who came in contact but how do they find out that it's a bacteria or a virus that's causing it because you can't yeah. see a bacteria or a virus right so how do Absolutely. they find out that that is a great question so that is why i said that epidemiologists work with other scientists and they work with other people in the scientific community because nobody can work alone so our team will need a group of scientists who can take pus from that lesion or that blister take it in a lab and observe it under the microscope so like i told you in the beginning there are different ways of studying humans one is if you take cells in a petri dish and study them in a lab and i told you those are also very important and useful for providing information so to be able to understand how chicken pox affects us or what is the virus or what is the pathogen that is causing chicken pox you need some people to take those cells and put them under a microscope and study them right so that is how you will study those cells and information from those cells will tell you how chicken pox actually works in the body how we can treat it how we can manage it all right so for all of this research for all epidemiological research you use lots of data right so can you tell us a little bit about this data how do you handle it where do you get it from yes so that is actually in my coming slides I I I will get to that. I okay. will definitely get to that. All right. So maybe we can start with that then. Okay. Okay. All right. Um yeah. So uh this is what now I was going to begin with. So the data will come just right in the next slide. Okay. So we have talked so much about epi studies. You must be wondering how exactly do we do this study? Now we got to know the history, the background, all the uh, things that are involved. But how exactly do I do a study? Right? before that let's understand what a study is okay we have talked about studies so much what is a study a study is just a scientific process of answering a question that you may have okay and how do you answer that question in an epidemiological study you use data from a population 
so for example if your question is does smoking cause lung cancer or your question could be does mumbai have more covid cases than delhi or your question could be which food item at the at a birthday party caused an outbreak of food poisoning all of these are very relevant questions that you want answers to these can be solved using epidemiological studies and you could answer your questions in different ways one way could be that you observe a group of people who are with you right suppose we have a group of people in this room we observe them we collect data on what their exposure is and what their outcome is right at the same time we ask them some questions and gather data on these things and try to see if there is a relationship between them for example uh, we could ask people questions on their tv watching habits how much time do they spend watching tv and we could measure their weight and see if they are overweight and then try to see if a lot of tv watching has led to an increase in weight or if increased weight prevents them from going outdoors and so they end up watching tv whatever it could be either way right so we ask them these questions we make people sit suppose you maybe make people sit in a room we ask them these questions and try to make correlations okay another way could be if i only start and observing people who have a certain disease condition and then ask them to recall to think of any exposure that they may have had in the past so suppose i am talking to people who have lung cancer and then i am asking them about some harmful things that they might have done in the past right one of them would be smoking so i will ask them to recall and remember and tell me if they used to smoke 5 years back or 10 years back so here we start with people who already have the disease and we want to see what they did in the past to cause this to cause this disease condition now this could be another way then there could be a third way you could start with people who had a certain exposure and then observe them to see if they get a certain disease for example i go to a school and there is a football tournament taking place and uh, some kids have used sunscreen and some kids are not using sunscreen okay what do i do i observe all of those kids for the 7 days of the tournament and i see if that sunscreen prevented them from getting sunburns while playing football so here i am starting with the exposure the sunscreen and i'm seeing if it is having an effect or not in the previous example the effect has already happened lung cancer and i'm asking them to think about the past and remember information and tell me right the last way could be those few cases where more than observing we also try to give something to people so like i said observation studies are a huge part of epidemiology but sometimes in a few cases we do some experiments also like we give two different kinds of medicines to people and see which one is more effective to say cure their knee pain right or in today's context i can tell you we uh, have uh, studies for covid vaccines so we give people vaccines we give one person the vaccine we do not give another person the vaccine and then we see which person performs better in terms of recovering from uh, in terms of catching covid 19 right so this is a small portion of epidemiology but very important aspect of epidemiology wherein we do some experiments on people to see how a drug works or how a vaccine works otherwise we mainly observe and mainly collect data and then try to make correlations right so what are your requirements when you want to do an epidemiological study okay these are the basic requirements that any study will want the first thing is you will need permission because you are you're just observing humans in most cases you are not doing any experiments but still you are dealing with other people and in terms of their health so we need to make sure that everything is allowed we are not doing anything harmful we are not harming anybody in the process we are not asking any questions that could be problematic for all those things you need a permission so once you prepare your study plan you need to get that permission from the relevant board wherever you are working and then you start the study the second thing is you need a group of people so you need to know who you are studying right so you will need a group of people whether it is students in a school or patients in a hospital whatever it is so you need a group of people and with the group of people will come the study location so you want a school a college university uh, whatever medical center clinic or just you know having people gathered in a park it could be anything then 
you need another team to collect data for you so data could be collected through questionnaires through surveys there are some instruments which will measure suppose they'll measure your body weight they'll measure your height and other things data could be anything it could be various forms of data that you collect and a certain team has to do the data collection which will involve interviewing the participants speaking to people or going to uh, going to people just to observe and make observations and once you have that data you will need some people who are good at maths who are not scared of numbers to be able to work with the numbers and make sense of whatever you gather like if you want to say that a certain proportion of the population is smokers so in delhi 56% of the people in delhi smoke how will you know this you will need to collect data from a certain group of people and then you will have to find the percentages for that you will need some mathematics and some statistics to come up with graphs which will explain your data and which will help you answer your study question now just a little bit is left i'll introduce you all to the study i am working on so before that we can have questions yes definitely um so i think a few questions that came up uh, were about doing these studies so especially mm -hmm. when you're not doing an observational study if you're giving somebody medicine mm -hmm. what happens if the medicine you give them is causing harm or it does have a side effect on the population yes so some medicines could have side effects and see some of this information we get to know beforehand when we this follows a certain process we first study the medicines in a lab okay then we go on to study these medicines and we see their effects on animals and after that if we feel that something is very very uh, dangerous and something is very very risky we will not move on to do that experiment on humans but if we feel that it is all right to proceed then we will go ahead with humans in humans also it is possible that some of these medications could cause some side effects or some discomfort what is important here is again while you are taking those permissions that i was telling you about clear information of what the possible side effects could be so that patients know beforehand that this is possible otherwise they'll feel very cheated that they got into a study they got a medicine and now they are feeling so sick and nobody ever told them that they could fall sick right so telling the patients beforehand and also letting your entire study team know and working with doctors so that in the case of an adverse effect or a side effect that a patient encounters there are medical professionals who are there to readily help you and make you feel better so all these again all these teams have to work together to be able to have a successful study doctors epidemiologists lab professionals all of them okay i think another really good question is in terms of timeline so how long mm -hmm. does an epidemiological study take so yes this is a very good question so epidemiological studies can be very short say if you are conducting a survey in 50 students in a school you could do it in one day and then you could take some time to analyze it and present your results some studies wherein like i said that um, uh, you take 7 days to observe people in the tournament and see how the sunscreen is affected them that is taking 7 days if there is something that needs more time to be observed it could take one year it could take two years there have been some studies in the past when we do not did not have a lot of information about heart disease so there was a group uh, in the west that was working on looking at what different things cause heart disease so what are the different risk factors for heart disease when we didn't know anything about it that study went on for so many years it went on for 20 30 years it it involved people and then later it involved the uh, children of those people so it kept going on so it it varies it depends on what you are trying to find out what your question is and how you are going to answer it so different methods take different time a survey takes very small time following people in time takes a very long time it could be 2 years it could be 20 years and also it depends on the money you need a lot of money to be able to follow so many people for so many years or observe people for so many years so it depends on your question as well as the resources that you have Yes, definitely. All right. So I think everybody is really excited to hear about what you do. So let's <laughs> let's get into that. Okay. Okay. So again, this has a small story involved, but it's a true story. Okay. So uh, my father's uncle, he used to stay in London, and he used to visit us every year. Okay. And he was a patient of heart disease. Now he carried this cute little pill box that you see on the screen. This is the actual photo of his pill box. 
and it had a lot of medicines for his heart disease and as a little girl you know i was very interested in science so i was very curious and i used to ask him a lot of questions about his health about his disease about what all medicines he was taking and he used to explain me in a very very simple manner as to what medicine is for what so that got me very interested then when i started studying about uh, reading up about medicines i realized that every medicine that we take has some side effects like someone put up a very good question medicines do have side effects because they are made from chemicals right so no medicine is side effect free some side effects are very very mild some we won't even come to know some could be a little serious what is important for us is to be aware of what medicine can cause what side effect so while i was reading up i realized that this heart disease pill in this box in this uh, pill box it also has a few side effects like pain in the arms and legs or numbness in the fingers or memory loss people forgetting stuff this is something that i found out while i was reading about this medicine some more interesting information that i got was there are some epidemiological studies that have said that this pill can make our memory stronger and some have said that this pill makes our memory weaker so there is a lot of confusion here we still don't know if it it makes our memory stronger or weaker also most of the studies that have been done to answer this question have been done on western populations so we do not have a lot of studies that have been done in our country right and since our people are different we have different dietary patterns we have a different biology medicines can affect us differently so then i decided that let me do a small study in my population to see how the pill is working in my population so what did i do i designed an epidemiological study wherein i will observe 300 people who are taking these medicines okay taking this medicine 300 patients of heart disease who have been prescribed this medicine i am going to observe those people apart from observing them and collecting data on their regular health status what i will do is i will give them a test like all of you you go to school you give a lot of tests like you take exam let's say i will take an exam this is a memory exam so i will ask them some questions and the way they answer it i will know whether their memory is strong or not and i will give them a score like you also get grades similarly i'm going to give them grades after their memory test and i'm going to take this test give them this test a few times right this will go on for 2 years so like someone was asking how long an epidemiological study lasts right so for me depending upon the time i have and the resources i have i have kept it as 2 years right so if i start today and i start taking the test of each of these patients i will do it till the next 2 years right 2024 and in the april of 2024 when i'm done with my exams uh, with, with this med- memory test i will see if their score changed from today till 2024 i'll see if there was a change in their memory score in the last 2 years now if their score went down i will know that their memory got a little weaker if their score went up i will know that their memory got a little better and if there is no change in scores i will know that this drug is not really having an effect on their memory at least in these 300 people right so this is how i'm going to make some observations collect some data and then i'm trying to establish a relationship between an exposure which is the pill and the outcome which would be some form of change in memory whether it gets better or whether it gets worse this is how i will be able to understand so if people have this side effect my study can provide some more knowledge uh, based on which we can take measures so that people don't uh, you know people are not inconvenienced maybe people can manage their side effect better or maybe they can shift over to another medication so providing this information to their doctors or their physicians who can then treat them accordingly so this is uh, how i'm going to do my study and uh, yes with this my uh, presentation is over we could take more question yes thank you so much rubina this is a great study and i'm sure everybody is wishing you all the best thank um, you thank you kavish so had a really good question so his question was won't your study or won't the mm-hmm. outcomes that you observe in your study be affected by other things such as age uh, gender 
very nice so i was not even expecting this question to come up here because i thought they are kids but this is very smart so i have to you know appreciate kavi she is asking such nice questions i see an epidemiologist in him so uh, is very right kavish there could be a lot of other factors that could be affecting the memory of a person so those factors i will collect information on those factors like one could be age some other could be some kind of maybe their diet they are following or any other medication that they are taking that could affect their age also so i will collect information on all of these things and then when i analyze my data i will make sure that my analyze uh, my analysis adjusts for these factors so that goes into the statistics part i will not go into the details because that's very complex but like i gave you an example of coffee smoking and lung cancer so smoking was an interfering factor so in my study also there will be some interfering factors like age and other things i will try and account for them when i analyze my data so statistics has some tools which can help us take these things into account so i will do that very nice question yes thank you kavish and as you can see rubina the the questions are just their equivalent to maybe your phd yes, viva <laughs> yes i'm very impressed <laughs> All right. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rubina. Um, is there anything else you would like to wrap up with? No, I would just like to uh, thank some people, of course, my advisory committee and the participants who I'm collecting my data from. So they are giving me a lot of information, and my sister Serena has helped me design these slides. So she she's my design ninja, and uh, then of course your platform. Thank you so much for having me here and letting me talk to the kids and introduce my field of work to them. Thank you so much, Ravina. You've done an amazing job. This is the first time we've talked about epidemiology, and I'm sure they're going back with lots of information, lots of more questions. Um, and I think, okay, there is one more question from Paridhi. Um, I think so. The project you described to us was from your PhD project yes. itself, right? Yes. Um, so yes. So everybody wants to know more about your PhD journey or what got you okay. into doing epidemiology. Okay. Okay, so yeah, like I said, uh, so I used to talk to my father's uncle a lot, and I was very attached to him. So I used to talk about his illness, about whatever medicines he was taking. So I think somewhere back then I had decided that heart disease would be an area I will work in. I didn't know if I was going to be a doctor or if I was. I actually didn't have any idea about epidemiology back then. So these kids now know what epidemiology is, but I didn't. <laughs> so uh, but i wanted to go into heart disease into cardiology but then uh, after my graduation when i wanted to go into post graduation so by then i had decided that i don't want to be a medical doctor i want to go into research and then i found a course uh, masters in clinical research which i thought would be appropriate for me since i want to work in research and it was only then when i got introduced to epidemiology like in my early 20s and uh, then when when i was deciding on my thesis topic for my masters i realized that i could actually work in epidemiology and do a study which involves epidemiology plus cardiology so uh, a part of it was my thesis topic uh, and then i extended it into my phd so <laughs> a lot of interest areas came together and uh, here we are that's wonderful that's that's exactly what a phd project should be <laughs> right <laughs> all right thank you so much rubina <laughs>